Okay, looks like we're good to go. Um, I'm just looking over for those of you that may not have been on the uh, trainings the last couple of days. Um, we are doing, um, we are recording the links for those trainings on the training registration page. And we are also recording uh, the links um, or adding the recordings to these links here underneath the inventory area. So I haven't added day two. It is out there in our registration page, but I have not put it in here yet. And also, um, we are going to eventually take the recordings from our overview sessions the last couple months. We've got some work to do on these um, and break them down into specific uh, se segments or chapters of the recording. And we're going to be adding them to here. These links that you're seeing now were links from last year's recordings. So we are going to update those to include the links for um, uh, this include the recording for this year. Um, so hopefully within the next month or so, we'll get that all done. Um, these um, links, the way that we um, drill down um, this area here, I think would be really good uh, for um, to, to give to your districts um, if they have any questions about a certain process in the programs. They want to learn how to add the different options to add an employee. They can just click on that particular area of the recording just to get that information instead of listening to a, a whole hour or two hours worth of information. So I think it'll be um, a really good tool to use uh, for your districts. And we'll probably mention in an upcoming newsletter as well that, the, that this information's out there for them to uh, click on and review. So what we're going to do today, I'll pull up my PowerPoint, and I think I'm going to go off the PowerPoint quite a bit today, actually, um, because we are talking about depreciation and the migration imports. Um, and I'll, you know, demo some some things, but I think um, a lot of the information we have, um, I will be showing, you know, uh, what's in the PowerPoint regarding that. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, all the information that I'm showing on here regarding to um, depreciation and um, what um, is suggested for districts uh, for how they cal calculate and control their depreciation. I mean, the system does it a certain way based on depreciation methods. But as to the policies and things that uh, school districts follow, that's up to their board policies. Um, I do have a particular PowerPoint, um, and I think I have it on the last slide here. Um, and I have updated this PowerPoint as well, and I'm going to put the updated PowerPoint out there, <laughs> excuse me, in our overview page. Um, but uh, last fall, um, AOS came out to um, OETSA and did a presentation um, and they did a great job and they, and it was tailored to school districts um, and how, what they need to look for in their depreciation, in their uh, fixed asset policies. Um, they talked about depreciation, what should be included. Um, they also um, talked about uh, what the auditors look for when they go to a district. Uh, um, during the audit of their inventory. So um, I attached that PowerPoint um, at the end here. Um, and it's just a, a good resource. And I use it, you know, when we get questions, and I'm sure you guys will too, um, because it's coming straight from AOS and um, their recommendations. All right, met a couple people here. Okay. So let's get started here. And so what I want to talk about first is how it does depreciation get calculated on the inventory system. And so depreciation, the um, life to date depreciation values are stored underneath transaction items. And so I have a table here of the fields that are being used when you when it calculates depreciation. So it's definitely looking at the depreciation method. So there are three types, straight line, which seems to be the method that 
district school districts use. Um, I think maybe all these years I've gotten one or two tickets on declining balance methods. And I've got a couple slides talking about declining balance method, but I'm not going to go into detail on those. You know, you guys can review the slides and the documentation, but it's not something that is used. Um, and so I feel like, you know, I think it's more important to focus on the straight line method and how um, that's being calculated on the system. So straight line, like I said, is the most widely used. Um, obviously, the other is none and declining balance methods. So you have to have something, whether it's none, you're not tracking depreciation on an item, or whether it's straight line, you need to have something in that field. It can't be blank. Um, and that may be a little different the way classic worked. Um, I think blank meant none in classic. Um, and so, you know, the way things migrated over from classic as well with depreciation, um, I think we all know that, um, and I think I talked about this yesterday too, that there were a lot of things in classic regarding depreciation um, that may not have been tracked as accurately as it could have um, based on um, missing things um, on the item. Uh, if they had um, never entered a depreciation method, but they had a useful life in there, well, it doesn't do a whole lot. You don't have that information or you didn't have a beginning depreciation or the district modified the life to date. It allowed them to edit the life to date whenever they wanted to. And just because they changed the life to date from 5000 to 7000 doesn't mean that $7,000 figure was the accurate depreciation amount. Those, those are migrated over then. So if those weren't being checked in classic, um, the migration did not calculate depreciation while it was migrating the data. It took the, what the values were at that time in classic and migrated them over just like it did with everything else. So um, with the new system came the audits and auditors saying, well, now, you know, redesign has a new system. I'm looking at it and depreciation figures are wrong. Well, they were wrong in classic too. Um, so as to why those, you know, that stuff wasn't um, looked at before, you know, is as anyone's guess. Um, but the districts are taking care of it now. They're cleaning it up. And so with cleaning it up the last couple of years led to problems with oh, my beginning balances don't match my ending balances on my depreciation or my life to date from, you know, last year isn't the current life to date um, figures that are showing on the items. And that's because, you know, if there was cleanup involved and things like that, it's not going to. So until, you know, districts, um, you know, have that information updated and everything is reflecting correctly, um, then, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a cleanup process, if you will, for them. And I know that um, we, put out uh, something in our documentation regarding life-to-date depreciation figures. We had a page in the documentation just discussing, and it was while districts were still migrating. If you've already migrated, this is what you need to do to take a look at your life-to-date figures and ensure that they are correct. If you haven't migrated over yet, this is what you need to do in Classic to make sure that those life-to-date figures are correct before you migrate. And we also were in discussions with the Otter State's office and they posted, a, I don't know if it was a bullet bulletin or just a message out there to their field auditors explaining the same thing. Um, so I think everyone was kind of like put on alert, you know, and aware. Um, and so I think um, the auditors are looking at this stuff um, and, you know, making sure that uh, the life to date figures are calculating correctly. Um, so it's, you know, kind of been something that's been ongoing here the last couple of years. Um, and I feel like, you know, we're kind of getting out of the woods of that now. Um, but, um, I definitely, you know, with all of those updates and changes that were made, and I just wanted to take a day, just like I did last year, just to talk about 
how the depreciation actually gets calculated. I know we had some bugs and stuff within the last year or two that we've been working out. And I, I think we might have one other one um, still that needs to be cleaned up. No, it's not about depreciation. It's another issue. Um, but um, but yeah, we're we're you know keenly aware of you know that you know there could be possible things that pop up with depreciation, and we'll we'll handle them as they come in. Um, but you know today we'll just focus on you know making sure that um, everyone has a good idea of how depreciation is calculated on the system, and in particular the straight line. So with um, the depreciation method, we also, um, there's also a factor um, not used unless you're using declining balance methods. So it's, it, they can put in a percentage of how they want to um, decline uh, the depreciation. The declining balance method is a faster way to depreciate um, than the slow straight line method. Um, beginning date is the date that the beginning uh, depreciation starts. So you have an acquisition date and you have a beginning depreciation date on an item. It's not gonna look at the acquisition date. It is looking at the beginning depreciation date to calculate depreciation. Um, most of the time it's the same. So I'll show you quick here. I'll go into an item. And so the acquisition date and the beginning date. So this is a good example of a uh, item that has the straight line method, but they don't have a beginning date. So, um, and this is an old one, probably not the best example, but um, they did not have, they don't have a beginning date here. So if this really is truly supposed to be tracked, it's a non-capitalized asset. So probably not as, as important. But if this is something that they need to clean up, they need to go in and edit and put in a beginning date to get this to start tracking depreciation correctly. Um, but usually the acquisition date and the beginning date are the same. Um, and we have put in um, a lock on the beginning date to make sure that it doesn't come before the acquisition date. I remember some tickets within the last year or so where the beginning date was in a prior fiscal year and the acquisition date was in the next fiscal year and it was causing problems with depreciation. So um, we have updated the system so that it's either looking at it to make sure it's the same or that the beginning depreciation date comes after it. The original cost, obviously, it's for depreciating the original cost, right? So. Um, that has to be part of the depreciation calculation. Uh, life expectancy, um, that's how many years you want to spread out the depreciation. So it's going to basically contain uh, the number of years that this item is supposed to be depreciated. Salvage value, if there is a fair value um, at the end of the item's useful life, maybe what they think it's going to be, uh, what the amount's going to be if they trade it in. Um, they can put a salvage value on there, and that will be included in uh, when depreciation is calculated. So basically, it's like subtracted off uh, because they know at the end of depreciation, I'm going to have a salvage value of $1,000 for this item. And then life-to-date depreciation, is that gets calculated automatically when an open period is closed. So when you close a period, it's going to go out there and calculate the yearly depreciation for each item that's tracking depreciation. Um, so uh, there are other ways that life-to-date depreciation can get updated, and we're going to talk about those there in a little bit. Okay, so Life-to-date depreciation is the depreciation for an item through June of the last fiscal year. So that's what it's supposed to be. Um, so when I'm looking at an asset that I uh, started depreciation in like this example, 2019, 
and my current period is 24 is fiscal year 2024. Um, that's my current and open period. The current life to date for this item would be from that beginning depreciation date of 7 1 2019 through June 30th of 2023, which is the end of fiscal year 23. So when I closed fiscal year 23, it added another year's worth of depreciation. And my life to date at that point, when I'm looking at that item, should be everything up through the end of fiscal year 2023. So obviously when I close uh, fiscal year 2024, it will add another year's worth of depreciation on there. So how do you find out what the current fiscal to date depreciation is? You can calculate it manually and we'll go through an example of that or you can write a book value and see what the fiscal to date depreciation is for a certain asset. Um, it calculates it on the fly and it, and it includes it in the book value report. So depreciation is tracked monthly in the application in case you weren't aware behind the scenes. It does uh, because not all beginning depreciation dates are going to be July 1st. You may acquire an item in October or December or February and you wanna start tracking depreciation on that day. Um, so it's, even if you put uh, February 15th, it's going to include the whole month of February, February 1st on. Um, um, so the day it doesn't look at, but it does look at the month. So that first year uh, when you're, you know, if I've got a, something I acquired in February and I put in a February 15th date, when I close the period, for fiscal year 24, it's going to track depreciation for February, March, April, May, June. So five months it's gonna track depreciation for, and it's gonna place then that current life to date then on the life to date uh, field once I close for the year. Uh, when generating a book value, what's nice about the book value is it, it actually contains three depreciation figures. And once we get into there, I'll, I'll show you when we run a report, um, but it's going to definitely include the life to date. So like I you know, just said, it's up to the end of the last year closed. It includes the current fiscal year to date. So like I said a little bit ago, if you wanna find the current or the fiscal to date depreciation so far in an item, run a book value on that particular item. And then it also includes at the end of the report, a total of the life to date and fiscal to date together. That's called the total depreciation. And then obviously the book value then, um, the value of the item is original cost minus total depreciation. That's the current book value of an asset. Um, and I have a little note here too, because sometimes this catches people. Um, so, one thing you want to make sure too is that if a district is in, you know, fiscal year 24, they're doing their inventory and it's near the end of the year, but they're not quite ready to close it yet. And they open fiscal year 25 and they start processing an inventory in there and they start running gap reports. Well, those, those, uh, like this schedule change in depreciation is not going to contain the right depreciation figures yet. Why? Because they never closed fiscal year 24. So the life to date doesn't calculate until you close a year. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. They're like, whoa, my life to date figures are way off. Well, that's probably the first question. It's, did you close? You know, I know you're in 25 right now working. Did you close 24? Um, and so once they close a period that will set the life to date figures for them. Okay, any questions so far? All right, so the depreciation method, um, again, and we talked about this at the start, is um, established by what the district's policies are. Um, and per AOS, um, and this was pulled from that OETSA, oh, uh, capital asset overview uh, presentation. Uh, it's any rational and systemic method 
should be, excuse me, may be used for um, depreciation methods. Um, like I said, a depreciation method is required in the software, um, whether it's non straight line or declining balance, something has to be filled in in the depreciation method when you're creating an item. And um, per AOS2, and as they mentioned in that presentation they did last year, straight line is the most widely used for school districts. Um, one other thing, too, I noted this yesterday. Oh, um, with this PowerPoint, I purposely added some notes to some of these slides down here just for helpful tips for you guys. Um, you know, if you're, you know, the purpose of this PowerPoint is for you to use this then, take what you need from it and use it for your training sessions. Um, so, um, you know, I just thought some of these uh, notes taken down here would be helpful as well. Okay, so our ways to calculate depreciation and the one that we're really gonna focus on, I'm going to use examples, is the straight line method. So straight line is the cost minus estimated salvage value that is spread proportionally over the estimated life of the asset. So this is a very basic formula of, com of um, computing straight line. So right here, you don't see like, when did it start? You know, we don't have a beginning date. Uh, we'll get into the actual calculation that the software uses here in a little bit, um, but this is a very basic formula. So um, districts don't have to have a salvage value. It's not required um, for them to track a salvage value and enter a salvage value for every item. And I'm gonna go back into my pick on one of these. Something a little bit older here. And something with a little more money. Maybe I'll pick on this one, the flashlight. So in here, um, here is our depreciation information. And like I said, um, once I set a method here, um, I also want to include a beginning date. And my beginning date is usually my acquisition date. I want to track a life expectancy um, so it knows that the $5,000 um, for my original cost is basically going to be depreciated over 10 years, beginning with October of fiscal year 23. Um, so since uh, this date is inclusive of fiscal year 23. Um, and so if a district um, also wants to track a salvage value, they can. They can enter in a salvage value here when they, you know, added the item, um, and that will be subtracted off when they, when it calculates life-to-date depreciation every year. So it's kind of like it isn't included um, because they know that they're going to have that leftover salvage value of that item at the end of the year, that it's wor still worth $1,000. It hasn't fully depreciated out. Um, so that's what that's for. And so you'll see then, you know, as that year closes then, um, and because this is in fiscal year 23, um, when fiscal year 23 closed, it posted an internal depreciation transaction um, at the end of that year. And based on when it started and the calculation, um, it, based on the whole calculation method, it uh, posted a depreciation for $375. And so you'll see that internal, and you notice you can't go in and make changes to this because the system created this, not a user. And so um, this then gets placed in the life to date figure. So if I would close fiscal year 24, and let's say it was another $375, I'd see another internal transaction, and then this would get updated as well. So um, it's just basically adding it on. So that's how, you know, basically the system is, is performing that depreciation. All right. So this is using that very basic calculation 
Um, and we've included this in our depreciation chapter um, in the wiki. This is just showing you a very basic straight line. And at you know, this point, I'm not even taking into consideration when depreciation started. I don't have a date on this one yet, but it's just showing I have an asset for $10,000. I put in my useful life. Because I have a salvage value of $1,000, I need to take that into consideration. So $10,000 minus my salvage value divided by five means that it's going to calculate a yearly depreciation of about $1,800 every year until it fully depreciates in five years. So very basic uh, calculation. What I want to do is explain um, what the inventory application does because it uses a slightly uh, different calculation than just a basic straight line. Um, so this is kind of the, well, this is basically how depreciation is calculated yearly um, in the inventory system. So the total depreciation is as of the end of the last fiscal year. So also called life to date. It's, and that obviously we see is stored on each item. So the system is going in and looking at original costs and then taking into what's the current life to date depreciation and subtracting that off minus any salvage value if they have a salvage value. And they take that then and divide it by the, the life, the useful life, minus what the age is of that item at the time. So obviously, if you know it's been, uh, if I have an item that's five years useful life and I've already had it for a year, it's going to subtract off that one year of age. Um, so it's basically, you know, looking at, hey, here was my original cost in my life so far. I've depreciated this much and it's aged this much. So subtract that off minus my salvage value to basically give me my yearly depreciation. So what's good about this uh, calculation <clears throat> that it is, it protects it from changes that occur because there could be changes. Um, you could go in and add an additional acquisition to an item, thus increasing the original cost, um, the life could be changed on the item. That's going to affect the depreciation as well. So um, it does take that into consideration. And also, um, for those years that have already tracked depreciation, um, it's not going to affect any prior year depreciation tracking. Um, when it's just doing its yearly life to date routine when it gets close when that period gets closed. So um, what I'm going to do is kind of take this calculation now and use it in an example of an existing tag. Um, I'm going to skip over that and go to this one. This one here should have pretty much referenced that basic, um, but I'm going to pick on a tag that I have out there on the system right now um, that is currently in the middle of being depreciated. Um, it was created in fiscal year 21. So it was for $14,900 and over 10 years. And the beginning depreciation started in September, not July. Um, and our current year right now is 2024. So this was added a few years ago. And how is that being depreciated? So I kind of want to go down to my notes here first, just so you can see how I calculated the yearly depreciation, especially for that first year, because it wasn't a full year. Beginning depreciation started in September. So really it's 10 months, not 12. And so what I did, is I took the original cost divided by 10 years to get that basic uh, value. And so the yearly depreciation is $14.98. However, I need to figure out for that first year what their um, life to date truly is for that very first year. 
So I would take the 1498 divided by 12 months to give me my current monthly uh, depreciation amount. So which is 124.8333. And of course, with the 0.8333, the rounding, it may cause a little difference, pennies difference um, in the life to date figure. So you have to keep that in mind when it's not just an even, you know, nice solid number like 80 or 85 cents or something like that. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, so I know right now for the first year, every month it's depreciated by $124 and 0.833 cents. So I have to, you know, then say, okay, so for that first year, it wasn't a full year, it was only 10 months. So I take that uh, 124.83 times 10 months to give me my life to date figure for that first year. So I'm going to plug that into my calculation. So 14.98 minus the 1248.3333 minus zero. I don't have any salvage value for this item. So that's always going to be zero. And then what's my life for this first year? Well, um, my, my life is always going to be 10, but my age is going to change every year. And right now I have to calculate what my age would be and subtract that off for this first year. And it's 0.8333 if I take that divided by 12 months. Um, so I subtract that out, and this calculation then equals the 1498 for the year. And so what happens then is I'm going into fiscal year 22, and how does depreciation get tracked? So it's looking at that calculation again based on what's happening in the current year. So again, the system is doing this behind the scenes. And again, my original cost is never going to change, $14,980, but my life-to-date depreciation has. So I'm taking the $12,48,333 uh, and adding it on to whole year's worth of depreciation, the $14,98, to give me the $2,746,333. So year two, $14,98 minus that divided by what my life is, which is always going to be 10, minus what my current age is. I've added on a year. And again, my yearly depreciation is 1498. So this goes on throughout the entire 10 years that this is going to be depreciated. This should fully depreciate by, let's see, we started in 21, so 2030, this should be fully depreciated as, as of the end of that year. That's been 10 years. Um, and so what I can do, so I'm just continuing on, you know, with my calculation until I get to the current year that I'm in. And so I'm currently in fiscal year 2024. So I have run depreciation and closed every year um, where I have really three years worth of depreciation, right? Fiscal year 21, 22, and 23. So my total life to date depreciation at this point at the end of 2023 should be 42.44 points with the pennies and the rounding. I ran a book value in 24 and it's a few cents off, but as you can see, it's, it's pretty much right on target with where my current life to date should be at. And if I would look up this item right now, we would see that as well. So the life to date should be reflective through the end of fiscal year 23, because right now I'm in 24. And also what is my current um, total depreciation, which remember is your life to date plus your fiscal to date. So my fiscal to date, my year to date on the book value would be the 1498 and it shows it there. And so obviously, if I add those two up, that is my total depreciation, which is reflected here as well, and which is reflected here in this calculation. Um, so I could continue on calculating this out through the rest of, you know, the uh, next, what, six years. Um, 
and it would you know be fully depreciated. So by the end of 2030, um, basically my original cost of 1499.80 is also going to be my life to date once I close fiscal year 2030. Um, so I hope that just kind of helps to see what the system is doing behind the scenes. So it's protecting that because it's looking at what's happened in the past versus, you know, uh, last last year's life today and calculating this year's life today. And it's, you know, very careful, you know, that it's just going based on, you know, what, you know, what is actually happening with this asset while it's depreciating. Okay, so, um, and I'll go and pull up this tag as well, 11898, so you can see that. <clears throat> so here is my actual tag with those same figures. So 2022, 2023, um, I think mine was might have been a little in this is a good thing to see as well. This is an excellent thing to see because my table is from 21 through 24. Well, this doesn't show that first year, right? Because 2021 is not on here. And that's because I migrated in 2022. <laughs> so I'm not going to it carried over whatever the life to date was for that item. So my fingers, it was right to begin with, um, which it is now that we're doing the calculation. Um, but it migrated over. And then since then, I have, you know, been closing out in inventory and it's adding another year's worth of depreciation to it. But you're not going to see that stuff carried over from classic in the depreciation transactions. This was set up to prevent people from going in and just willy-nilly editing the life to date depreciation field. It needs a transaction. So that's why we created this so that it controls it. So either you'll see it uh, display transactions that are done internally when you close, um, or it'll show transactions created manually if a district needs to update the current life to date. They have to go through a depreciation transaction, and we'll get to that here in a little bit. Okay, any questions about this particular calculation and how the system is working behind the scenes? Hopefully that helps to see that. Um, these next two slides, are, um, I, or maybe this slide, um, it talks about the declining balance. And like I said, I'm really not gonna go into this. Um, I don't know any more really than what these um, uh, slides provide. Um, I've never really had, well, maybe we've had one or two tickets on declining balance, um, but it does kind of show you how it is being depreciated. Here's an example. Um, and we did put this out here, and it is based on the factor, which is the rate, and um, they would plug that in there. And you can see how it tends to depreciate faster because it's uh, of worth more value there at the beginning, and then how the depreciation slowly declines, hence declining balance. Um, so it doesn't track it as the same amount every year, like straight line. That makes sense, straight line. This is declining. So it depreciates faster at the beginning and then slower um, as it ages. So that's about all I'm gonna say with declining balance. So let's talk about the depreciation options that um, inventory has. So, um, the one option that we have out there is the um, depreciate option from the grid. So I'm in the items grid, and if they want to recalculate depreciation um, from the grid, they can do that. And what I mean recalculate, it recalculates depreciation, pretty much resets it. 
Um, and so this is one that um, they do have to be careful about um, because, you know, you're, it, right now, is, and as you could see on the prior slide when we went through example, that Life Today is working hard to keep that detailed depreciation every year. Um, and that's the historical account of what's going on with that item. And it was depreciating so nicely at $14.98 every year. Um, but if something happens um, that changes the value of any of the fields that are currently involved in tracking or calculating depreciation, this life, this depreciate option, they pretty much blow that all out of the water. And um, I have a slide here, and I kind of want to explain that slide because I think the rest of this would make more sense. So the next slide shows what happens with the tag before you run depreciate after. And I really think this is an issue if a district has done something on an item that greatly affects any of those fields I just talked about, whether they changed the life, whether they added, um, increased the original cost during the lifespan of the item. So if they had an item for $5,000 and it depreciated out for 10 years, and in year five, they decide to increase the original cost by you know, an additional couple thousand dollars, they're gonna see a difference in their depreciation. And that's what we're seeing on this first one here. So the original cost was five grand and they have it depreciated over $5,000. So it is depreciating yearly a thousand bucks. But in year four, they increased uh, the original cost of this asset um, to 7,000. And so with that then, um, that, obviously increased the yearly depreciation. And so it added really, they've got an extra, you know, um, yeah, they, they've got an, an extra couple thousand to deal with. So it's increasing that. It doesn't affect what's already been depreciated in those prior years. So it's not going to disturb any historical depreciation, but now it's going to you know, speed it up and increase it in order for it to still depreciate out in five years. So, you know, so if I, you know, fully depreciated that out in five years, this is basically what my depreciation is going to be for those five years. First three thousand dollars each year, last two years, two grand. Now, if within that, maybe that year four after I did this additional acquisition, I went in and selected that item and clicked on the depreciate option and recalculated depreciation, it doesn't care about what's happened in the past. It's going to look at the current values, whatever those are. And in this case, they changed the original cost. Um, and so it's going to look at that and say, oh, you know, you have updated this and, you know, but I, I don't know when this started or um, all I care about is that I've got an item now that is worth $7,000 and it's got a um, life of five years. I need just to go and calculate that straight. So it's just going to um, take that every year and just put $1,400 in it. So, um, so yeah, so you can see how it can greatly affect well, how that historical tracking of the uh, value of that is. So what is the recommendation on which way to suggest the district do? Leave alone or recalculate? Um, when it comes to these type of assets, Sharon, I think they need to talk to their auditor as to what they want them to do uh, because um, they need to be aware of how that can you know change things um so i think it's best that they let you know and i've got it down here <laughs> my favorite reply to right um and i've got it down here in the notes and i purposely left them in the notes so that we all can see that it's recommended that they discuss this with their auditor before they use the depreciate 
Now, most of the time, they may not be making a lot of changes to, you know, a majority of their assets. They probably aren't changing the life or um, the original cost. You know, they're just letting the thing depreciate out. So if they would run depreciate, would it make a difference, right? They may have, maybe there was a couple cents off or something like that. No big deal. But it didn't disturb because they didn't do anything to the asset all these years. They just let it depreciate. But if they've got some where they're like, uh, you know, should I run depreciate on these? I think they need to get the auditors, uh, you know, thumbs up on that to just to tell them, you know, and we've got this all documented. The auditors can see that stuff out there. You know, we have a warning about using this option. It's always been that way, even in classic, you know, they had to be careful about that. Um, but another nice thing about this um, option is that when they run the depreciate, um, it creates a projection report. And what I would do is run the projection report on those assets that I know I've made changes to, and it might affect the depreciation if I run depreciate. And I send that to my auditor and say, what do you think? This is what I'm going to do. Are you good with this? These are the ones I plan on um, you know, changing, and this is what the new life to date is going to be. So it shows the before life to date figure and the after. So they can send that. You know, feeling good that, you know, if they've got the blessing from their auditors, uh, then they can move on and appreciate those. So that report is nice. So the projection will show them what it's going to look like. Once they get a thumbs up, they can go in and run the actual option. And it will go out there and change those. Okay. Any other questions, and I'll show you that depreciate option in case you're like, where is that? Um, and it is, it's just right up here at the top of the screen. And so all they would do is just select the items that they want to depreciate. And like I said, what it's going to do is it will give them a projection first. And so they just generate that. Say, hey, let's take a look and see if it's made any changes or if it hasn't. Um, and like I, you know, like I said before, most of the time, if they haven't made any major modifications to any of those fields on the item that would affect their depreciation, like I said, original cost, life, uh, depreciation date, uh, things like that, um, then they're not going to really see any difference between the before and after. So, but it, what's nice is, yeah, it'll definitely show them if for some reason they weren't tracking and now they set the depreciation method and they set the uh, beginning depreciation date, they're gonna see a big difference here because it's basically catching life to date depreciation up, right? Because they were supposed to be tracking life to date and they weren't. And so if they use that depreciation op and it, option, it'll go from zero to whatever the newly calculated life to date is, so. Okay, now um, instead of just doing a massive recalculate of a life to date depreciation, um, another thing they could do is go in and just make a specific change to a specific item. And this happens. Uh, auditors say, you know what, you've got you know a couple uh, tags out there where the life to date's wrong. Um, and whether whatever they want them to do, whether they want them to run the depreciate if they're or if they're like, we would actually prefer you go in and create a depreciation transaction to increase the life to date, then this is where they do this. They will go into the actual item and be able to create a depreciation transaction. Um, and so, but like I said, this life to date field is not modifiable. And that's a good thing compared to, you know, the way it was in classic, um, which, you know, like I said earlier, probably caused a lot of headaches. Um, so instead, they're going in and creating a depreciation transaction. Um, and that then will alter the life to date depreciation amount. Um, with um, depreciation transactions, obviously, it can only be done 
um, for active items. So you've disposed of an asset. Obviously, you can't change depreciation. And for items that have uh, not been fully depreciated. If you're trying to go, if they're trying to go in and add depreciation to an item that fully depreciated last year, they can't uh, because it's there's nothing to, to, to change. Um, and so it needs to be done in obviously a current and open fiscal year. So what happens is when they go in and enter an amount in here, um, it's going to take that amount and it's either going to be added or if they're entering a negative adjustment, um, it'll subtract it from the existing life to date amount. Um, I don't know if, I think I probably will, tr will give one a shot here. Um, got a ticket or a tag out here. Okay, so if I actually go in and just um, view this at this point, and I scroll down and I see, you know, the internal ones that were done when I closed, and let's say for some reason this life to date figure is wrong, and the auditors came back and said this should actually be 1396.26. Um, and they want you to specifically update it to be that figure then right now I can see I can't do anything yet. I have to go in and edit. And when I go in then, um, I'm able to actually go in and click on create. And so I'm putting in my reason why. And I can put in the day or the audit year or whatever. Um, the more detail, the better. And then from here, like I said, I want to increase increase this by a hundred bucks to be thirteen ninety six. So if I just put that in and click on save, um, it will increase this. It created basically because I'm in fiscal year twenty four. Um, it's going to create a manual adjustment to the life to date, and it updates this. So obviously, if I did something wrong, it should have been 1496. I can edit this and change it to 200. If it was very wrong to begin with, I can go in and just delete and delete this altogether. Um, like I said, you have to be in that open and current period to do that. Um, but that will take care of it. I want to click on save too to make sure that that's been saved. And there we go. So, and all of this obviously is audited as well. And so is the uh, depreciate, you know, you have that report. And I know with um, EISD PR, for those of you that used Classic, um, that was like the Bible. If you lost that report, you were in trouble because audits didn't audit that stuff back in Classic. You had that EISD PR, just like the EIS cap too, uh, changing capitalization thresholds. You needed that thing. Because it it wasn't out there for you just to run, um, and it wasn't audited. So with this, you still get these reports. You know, like when you run the depreciate option, um, you know, you get the projection report and you get the actual. But it's also audited. So if I needed to go out there and run something on a particular tag that I made a change to, I can go into the audits report. You know, like what we covered yesterday, and select that specific tag and see what all has been changed. Now, for those of you that have viewed an audit's report, a lot of stuff on there. So it's not going to basically say, hey, I'm doing my audit's report and it's gonna show me exactly that um, I ran a depreciation adjustment. You know, it's what it's showing is on the items record, your life today changed from 1296 to 1396. So they have to read between the lines that, okay, that means that I must have done some type of depreciation adjustment or recalculated depreciation in order for that life to date to change. So it doesn't just spell it out in the audits. You, you know, pretty much have to look at that item and see that the life to date figure changed. It'll show the before and the after. So the report is a little bit easier um, versus the audit report where you kind of have to read 
you know, down there and it will show you at that point when you go to that actual field. So. Okay. Um, this last thing I wanted to talk about um, is possible reasons, possible reasons why the prior year book value, the total depreciation, I'm talking about the book value in particular, no longer matches the current year life to date depreciation. And so these are just pulled from some of the tickets that we have seen. So I thought it was a good idea just to put this on a slide um, so that you guys can use this as reference. We also put it out there in our, in our FAQ page. And if I haven't talked about our FAQ page, we keep adding to it in inventory and we will continue to do so. But there is a lot of good FAQs in there that you can pass on to your districts. They're not sure at the FAQ page and see if it's out there first. Um, but one of them that we just put on there recently was this particular thing. So, um, so yeah, you guys can read through this, but I just wanted to leave this on here in case, you know, you do get questions uh, regarding this. All right. And the last thing, I'm trying to keep this one short because I know I've kept you guys over um, the last couple of days. I think each one's been almost two hours or over two hours. Uh, the last thing I wanted to focus on before we before we do, because I'm kind of switching gears here, um, is talk about the non-migration procedures in the wiki. And in particular, the actual steps to do the importing um, of the data. So before we start on that, any other questions about depreciation? All right, so what I'm going to do is I am going to switch over to our non-migration procedures that we have out here. And so, you know, we were so focused on migrating districts versus districts that haven't might that aren't going to migrate. So we kind of called this at that time non-migration procedures, which may not be the best name for it now because we're past all of the migration stuff. Um, and really, it should, probably should be retitled, retitled for districts starting new in inventory or something like that. But I guess we'll leave it alone for now. Um, but um, this is out here underneath our appendix. Um, so, you know, we've got our FAQs out here that I just talked about. This is pretty much done. Yay. Um, and then we have our non-migration procedures. And so um, basically, we kind of took some parts of the migration procedures that are to be used in the non-migration steps in here and also added a few things to it. Um, so these first four steps really have to do with um, setting up um, the instance and things like that. And it depends on if you're hosted with the management council or not. So um, you still wanna create, if you don't, you still wanna follow those steps that we have listed in the migration procedures um, to get you know, all of that set up, get the container created and all of that. Um, if you post with the management council, instead of this, you wanna reach out to the management council and they'll help you with this and get that set up for you. So once that part is set up, you've got your instance, your blank instance for your district. And so you want to follow these steps in order, um, in order to make sure that um, everything is entered, updated, um, the gap flags are enabled, the fiscal years look good before you actually import their data. And so what we did is, you know, with a regular system import, so if a district's on um, inventory already and they want to add a bunch of items and um, 
the items have to be in the same acquisition year in an open year. So if they're in fiscal year 24, um, all of their items that they're adding have to have a fiscal year 24 acquisition date. So for a district that's starting new on inventory, they're going to have a bunch of items sitting on a spreadsheet somewhere that they've had that they're tracking that have several different acquisition dates from several different years, archived years. They could have some all the way back to land that they acquired in 1823. Um, and so they can't use the regular system import because it's not in the current fiscal year. So what they have to do is use our migration import, which recognizes those archived years and allows them to basically mass import items. Um, and it's to be used for new districts starting up. Um, if there is a situation where you need assistance or your district does with items from archived periods, um, you need to create a ticket to us. So, because um, we need to review that and ensure that um, you're able to do that using the migration importer or you're just going to have to create those items using the current year date. And if they're capitalized, um, you can go in and create post and air adjustment so that item shows, even though it was acquired three years ago, your, when you create the item in, your, in that acquisition window, have to put in a date for the current fiscal year. You have to, um, in order to move on to the next window. But in that next window, when you're in the item, you haven't posted it yet, you also have the acquisition date in there as well. You can record the true acquisition date there to say that, you know, my acquired date was, has to be in the current year, but I really acquired this uh, in 2021. You can put that date in there. You can post the item. So really, you're going to have an acquisition. When you look at the acquisition, the acquisition record is going to show a 2024 date, but when you look at the item record, it's going to show that 2021 date. And what you can do is on the acquisition, you can go in and edit it and check mark that error adjustment flag. So, and this is really only has to do with capitalized assets. Um, and when you check that error adjustment flag, you run the gap schedule you had a $50,000 item that should have been added two years ago and it wasn't, it's not going to show the $50,000 underneath the acquisition. It's going to show it underneath the adjustment column. So just a little tip um, about how those are to be done. Um, otherwise, if you know, you're talking a few items, that's the way I would suggest it. And of course, they can talk to their auditors to see what they recommend. But if you're encountering a situation where a district's like, I got 25 items that were prior years that just totally got missed. Maybe they started new in redesign, um, keep saying redesign, in inventory. Um, and then they realize the next year that they had a spreadsheet that they missed. And it's still items from all over the place, archived periods. What do I do with these? create a ticket to us so we can kind of review that to see. Those are those unique situations where we need to look into it as well and make sure that, you know, you can use the migration importer to import it. Or if we recommend that they enter them in manually using those error adjustments. Um, so so it's just, just some tips to help. So getting back to this, oh, I got off on that topic, but anyways, it's it's still good information. Um, so once your container set up, you're at a empty instance, what do you do first? So um, what you want to do is you want to make sure um, that underneath core in the configuration, you set up the configuration information and there's certain things. So you're going to basically go in there and edit and add the district information, their name, their IRN, the last year closed. So, you know, if you're like, well, they've got everything up through fiscal year 24 on this spreadsheet. So if that's, you know, what they have sitting there waiting to get imported in, 
um, then your last fiscal year closed is going to be 6-30-2023. Um, enter in a report bundle, um, email address, um, you know, making sure that um, that information is set up. And uh, so when they do close the year, the report bundles get emailed properly. So if the district is GAP compliant, then select that enable GAP flag. Please do that. Please, please do that before you import their data. That way the, the, the district knows between that and the capitalization criteria, what um, it's gonna set up the gap parameters and restrictions, and it's also gonna capitalize um, the items um, that need to be based on the current cap threshold uh, figures. So you definitely go into core configuration, take care of that. And then underneath core, the fiscal year. So your instance will use the current date to create a fiscal year. So I got a little um, heads up. We do have a bug right now um, and it's invoice or inventory issue 5, 553 that um, the fiscal year date um, is populating like a 6-30-23 is the start date instead of 7-1. Um, and so that is something that we are correcting, I believe, on scheduled for the 2024.4. So could be a little bit before that gets in place, um, but it shouldn't hinder. You know, if you have a district that wants to start new on inventory, they may see that underneath the fiscal year grid, but that's okay because what's gonna happen is it will get corrected with a patch um, on that release. Um, so that it fixes that year. They, they can still continue on, um, but um, that is something that we're aware of. Um, but one thing I really, and I it's not something that we have plan on changing, I don't think, is that when, you know, like I said, when you look at the fiscal years, it's going to use the current date. So it's going to use 2024, um, and it's going to be the first fiscal year. And, but you're, what you're going to see also is the cap criteria is going to show $1,000 in 25 years. So I'm betting all my money that that's not the district's capitalization policy. And so that has to be changed before you import their data because um, that's, that's kind of... Uh, probably nothing's ever gonna get cap capitalized because it has to meet both of those. So again, if I go back to my items here, go up to core and fiscal years. So I'm talking about the dollar limit and the life limit. So that first year, you know, you're just starting new, you're gonna see just this row and it's going, that's where we might have that bug here. Um, but it's going to show $1,000 in 25 years. So you have to change that before you do any importing of their, their data. And we do have it explained here that, you know, make sure that, you know, the district follows their capitalization policy. And in the next step below, we talk about how they need to reset their cap criteria to what the district's policy is. And it's very important then because what happens then, um, those items are going to look at that cap threshold, determine if they're capitalized or not. So uh, so once you, know, you review the fiscal year, so you may not really be actually be doing anything in there, but you're just reviewing it. Where in the configuration, you're editing it to add some stuff to set that up. So, um, and please do not create prior year periods. I don't think you can even do that anymore, but if it does allow you, please don't. I think that might be something we're, we're working on as well. Um, and then under system use uh, system menu, um, we have the users option will allow you to create user accounts. So, you know, you need to set up user accounts for, you know, the district and maybe the ITCs. Uh, the ITC uh, staff that uh, may be in, uh, you know, viewing information and stuff like that. 
uh, for the district. Um, so under system menu, you want to make sure that that's um, set up. So you're actually going to be going in and adding user accounts. Also, the capitalization criteria, what we talked about here. So $1,000 in 25 years is not what they want. You're going to go in and change that. So just to go back here. So um, that first year, it'll show, like right now, it's showing what my current one is. But when you're starting brand new, you're going to see the $1,000 in the 25 years. So change those. Um, you can run a projection, but you don't have any data right now. So it should be empty. Um, but make sure that you run the actual. That way, your cap criteria is set. Oh, okay. migration. And then the next thing is the configuration area underneath system. And so this is something obviously that you guys are, are assisting with. And so all of this information needs to be set up correctly. Um, if they're using um, uh, ADS, uh, any password configuration information, the email configuration in order for this email address to send the email report bundle or email the report bundle to somebody successfully. The email config needs to be updated. Um, and then the job is just the ability to view scheduled jobs. There's really not a whole lot on there other than you know viewing that. And then the biggest thing here is our migration import. So this is where it's gonna allow you um, as the ITC to import uh, or mass load their item acquisition and disposition for any archived periods, which is real cool, you know, because you could just take all that stuff that they've been sitting in their spreadsheet for multiple years and plug that in. So um, these are just notes regarding this. So if you're wanting to mass load data, you know, obviously via spreadsheet, um, uh, one thing is core codes. Um, so if this is something where they are starting new, you know, they're wanting to import, um, like maybe their location codes ahead of time, if they want to, um, they can do that by going in and following those import spreadsheet templates that we have out there underneath the import chapter and load those in. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that um, if those four codes aren't out there already um, and they go and import um, a spreadsheet full of item data, it's going to add those core codes automatically once they import it. So the one caveat with that is that it's going to import the code, but obviously not the description. So what they're going to see is a bunch of core codes created, I go down to functions, that say user imported, user imported, user imported. So um, if they add these in ahead of time using spreadsheets and have that stuff already loaded, that's great, you know, because it's already taken care of. Um, but if they let the item import take care of it, then probably the easiest thing, it just depends on how many they have. You know, I have quite a few function codes here. Maybe it's best for me to export this out into a spreadsheet, update them all real quickly, and import it back in using the system import. Um, that would be one way, um, especially locations. But some of these, like asset classes, no, oh, I have a whole lot. Those all say user imported. I'm basically just going to go in and edit each of these and update the um, description to what it should be. So, you know, so there is definitely some uh, setup involved with all of this. Um, so mass loading new items inquired in an open period. Again, if I'm in 24 and I have items that I want to just add in 24, um, that it have a 24 date, I can use the system import chapter to do that. Um, but for what we're dealing with here, 99.9% .9 of the time, 
you're going to have items from all over the place, all different fiscal years. And so that is definitely going to be something that you need to be involved in. And the steps to handle that are in here. So we're going to get to that here in a little bit. But before we do, uh, just one other thing is once the items are imported, um, it um, describes here what needs to be done to set up their pending file, which we strongly recommend they do. Don't enter every item in manually, pull it from the pending file. So um, this just talks about that as well. Um, so I'm going to back up here and just talk about how do you import these spreadsheets? What's the best way to do it? Um, and if I go down to the migration import, um, here is where, you know, it looks a little different than the system import. Um, so it's got a um, place where you upload the file, where you select the import type, which it could be item, it could be acquisition, it could be disposition. It just depends on what you're wanting to import it in. Um, if you're just creating the items and you want just one acquisition tied to it, you don't have multiple acquisitions tied to it, let the system do it for you. You import that item spreadsheet, you select create acquisition records, and it imports it. So, so down here, what we've done is we've kind of explained those different import types. So the item import, like I said, is going to create an item record underneath transaction items. And if you are using GAP, you're, if you are set to use GAP, you want to make sure that the beginning balance column is included on your spreadsheet. So the same template spreadsheet format we already have out there underneath the sim system import chapter. So use that spreadsheet that's out there whether you know this is one where you're doing just items for the current year or whether you're doing a migration import. Um, you know, you basically can go in there. The only difference is these migration imports need that beginning balance column, which is basically the original cost. So you're adding the original cost under the original cost column, and they're also including the original cost under the beginning balance column. That way, you know, because the reason why is you might have an item from five years ago. Um, and, you know, it's going to look at that date and it's going to add that date from five years ago and it's going to create the acquisition for that date from five years ago because you're using the migration import. But you also want to make sure that that beginning balance is set too, uh, because it's been five years. It should be on there. It's five years old already. So that beginning balance should be included. Um, yes. Um, I've got a question on those um, spreadsheets um, for just a single I, or single acquis acquisitions. Is mm -hmm. it your recommendation that we load the life to date depreciation that the district already has calculated or to go ahead and calculate those once the items are put in? That's a good question because um, we don't really know if those life to date figures are correct, right? If, right. If they Right. So if they could ensure that they are, then yes. But um, it, you know, it's if you're going in and importing them in and doing, I don't know if you guys are doing like a test first to see how the import goes. You could run a projection depreciation, to, you know, by going into the uh, depreciate option on the items grid, see if there's a big difference. Um, and then let's say we go ahead and load, load those when they close their first fiscal year, then it will it recalculate to be correct according to what the system rules are? If you let the life to date that currently is in there. Right, let's say we load the items and the life to date that they give us is not correct on some of the items and they mm -hmm. let it go. And then they close fiscal 24 and then the recalculates the life to date depreciation. Is it going to bring it up to what it should be? It's going to add another year's worth of depreciation. It may not be so. It might not be correct if the life to date wasn't correct to begin with. Gotcha. You got it. Okay. 
Um, so in here, um, you know, like, like I said, you're going to be using these, you know, I would use recommend using the uh, template spreadsheets that we have up there already. And, you know, if you're going in and creating um, or importing an item spreadsheet, um, like I said, make sure that the beginning balance um, and when you do that, it's going to, if you select this, it's going to create the acquisition record at the same time. So you don't have to do a separate acquisition record because it's taken care of by clicking on this. So if you know you don't have like, I know there's districts that may have, they've been tracking this and they may have five acquisitions for this one item and they want the five acquisitions to be listed when they import, they just don't want one item with one acquisition that is the total amount um, of those five items. That's the case then, um, you know, you're going to create uh, acquisition import to import those in, to mass import those acquisitions. And that's all explained down here. Um, these are just explaining the types that are available. And then you've got the disposition and we've had uh, tickets where they want disposed of assets to appear. Maybe they're larger items and they just want it to show on the inventory. Um, so if that's the case, then um, you're gonna use that disposition import spreadsheet and you can use that to mass import dispositions. Doesn't happen a whole lot when you're talking about a new inventory, but it is available. And so, this just talks about the type. This talks about how to go about importing, whether you're mass importing items where you have one acquisition, you don't have multiple ones per item, you're gonna follow these steps. However, like I said, if you, know, you have a district that wants to see those multiple acquisitions on the acquisition grid for each item, then you need to follow these steps. And it is very important that you follow it in the order that's listed here in order for it to load the information successfully. And then the last one is if you know your district wants to, to include disposition transactions, um, then you're gonna have to follow these steps in the order listed here in order to get those on the system correctly. Because basically this is going to have an item, an acquisition, and the disposition on there. They all three have to be on the system. Um, so this just kind of goes through, this is the easiest one, probably the one that is used most often. Most districts are probably like, yeah, okay, just, just create one item and one acquisition, you know, and that's all I need, you know, those match. And so basically you're going in there and you've got the item record, making sure that the beginning balances are on there because you've got items listed on here for multiple years. Um, and if it's something where, like, you know, like Sharon had said about the life to date, you don't, you know, want to plug that in there. You want the system to recalculate it after the fact. That is an option. Um, it just depends if the district can guarantee that those life to date figures are correct. Um, so. and it, yes. I've got a few questions about the multiple acquisition load. Yes. We are finding more and more districts that we're bringing on have those situations. And um, the information that's on here tells us how to do it, but or the steps that we have to do. But I think it needs to be kind of um, a little bit more information because the okay. one thing that we found and I'm getting ready to try this again because I'm not sure if it was just something that one of our other people had issues with or not. But if we have an item that has more than one acquisition or more than two acquisitions, let's say they have three acquisitions, let's say it's a concession stand or something, and they've made changes to it over the years, and mm -hmm. they have three acquisitions, when we put all three of those acquisitions for that one tag number in one acquisition load, we get an error. We have to load, we had to load all three of those acquisitions separately in spreadsheets for them to load before we could add the item then. Were they the same? I'm trying to think of the reasons why. Do they all have the same date? 
Yes, they did. Because in that situation, they had the same dates because they were, oh, I'll have to go back and look now. They were reducing original cost. And for some reason, they put acquisitions in for negative amounts. Uh -huh. The one I'm working on now are not the same dates. So I'll let you know if that happens on the ones that I'm going to do today. Um, okay. We have, I, I know there's specifically one item that has three acquisitions. They're all different dates and they're all different positive amounts. So I'll see if that happens. Um, the other thing is um, when you're adding these acquisitions, like I said, this one that I'm doing on has three different acquisitions. They all have three different dates, three different amounts. And I understand then when I do the item, I add all three of those together for the original cost, correct? On the item right. screen in the you beginning balance. But what do we do on the item screen for the, let's say the useful life? They have different useful lives on each of those acquisition different on the acquisitions in this spreadsheet that they sent us. And I'm assuming that they just fill those in just because, because the useful life is not on the acquisition anyways, but we're pulling those out to create our own acquisition load. Right. But when I'm looking at them, I like, what date do I put on those acquisitions or on the item? Do I put the original date and then the original useful life? Or do we update those to be the last one? So I, I can see, you know, why it might be helpful just to put a few more tidbits on there in, you know, in these like used cases here. That's a good question because you got to think about when you create an item and, you know, and then two years later, you add an additional acquisition to it. it doesn't update the item correct on the, um, it doesn't update the acquisition date on the item. So. Right. I would use, you know, you've got three acquisitions. That first acquisition date should be the same as the date that's on the item record. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. yeah. And that's what I was leaning towards is the original item itself is what I was going to put on as the item information and just update the acquisition in the beginning or the beginning balance to equal all the acquisitions together and leave everything else on that item, what they had originally. Correct. You got it. Okay. I'm looking here in the acquisition import to see if there's any hang up with why you would have to do three separate ones. And I know we used to have, and I'm thinking way back with spreadsheet imports in EIS, almost like we had a separate column that somehow identifies, even though they're all the same date, there was something like a count or something that allowed you to. Right. Import. I remember that. Right. There was a count. So you can have acquisition one, count one, count two, count three. Yeah. I was thinking that unless things have changed, because I know that I believe that was working at one time is that even though they all had the same date, maybe, you know, I don't know. It's been a while since it tested that, but. I'll make note of that too, Sharon, but let me okay. know what happens with that one that you do. But I just wonder if it's a hang up with, if it's the same date, is it not looking at those other okay. acquisitions because of the date? Yeah. So, okay. Um, and, and the other thing was the, the, the last one that we did after we added all the acquisitions and then the one item and we loaded that the original cost was doubled we had to recalculate no not the original cost i think the depreciation was doubled we had to recalculate the dep depreciation on those items oh. but i'm not sure if i wasn't sure if casey said when he did that if he actually uh, marked don't um don't update the original cost You said the depreciation. No, now I'm confused. Now I'm confused. Was it original cost? I think he said it was the original cost. Okay. Because I just wonder if it's something with that where somehow they had that checked. And maybe let me see if I need to have it. I'm looking at the steps for 
mass importing items with multiple acquisitions. So you're going in, you're creating the spreadsheet for the item import, and then you're creating the acquisition spreadsheet containing all of the related acquisition records. And you upload the acquisition record first. Right. This will ensure the acquisitions update original costs yield won't interfere with the items original. So we purposely have it that way. And then you import that. And then you go in and import them the item spreadsheet. Uncheck create acquisition records, which makes sense because you've already loaded the acquisition records. Right. This wouldn't have been where, well, but then you would have double acquisition records and he probably would have seen that. So, right. Um, yeah. Um, I'll let I'll, you know what happens today. Okay. Yeah, please do. So, and then, you know, if we need to do further testing on our end. We will. Yeah, because sure. I've got a spreadsheet that's probably about 30 items or 30, 30 lines on it with multiple acquisitions. So I'll let you know how what, what happens with those. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Kind of looking through here. Um, also, one thing to kind of keep careful of, too, could he have had those same tags on this one and then did a separate one and accidentally included acquisition records from tags here? And again, and it could have updated yeah. it. That happened multiple times. <laughs> we we started over many times. So, gotcha. <laughs> so I'm I, not quite, I'm not quite sure. We might have got he might have gotten, you know, into one of those and one of those situations, and and that's what we were talking about. So, yeah, I just wonder too because I I remember when I was like doing um, running through these uh, cases, um, and I, I think I was helping a, a ITC. And I did, I was, had to be like very careful, like, okay, I want to make sure that this spreadsheet just has these items on this exactly. spreadsheet and that this spreadsheet doesn't have those same items so that I'm not double posting or double updating something. Right. Um, to, and to I, cause and, an and I think, I think that's one of the things that for the district's point of view, when you send that template to them and you tell them don't put items in here that have multiple acquisitions I really don't think they understand what that means because yeah. it does come back and if we've got a 700 line spreadsheet and we're adding all these items we're not going to go through there and verify that those tag numbers are do are you know don't have duplicates Absolutely. so I'm not quite sure if there's a better way to describe that to the district when you're sending that out to say hey just give me single acquisitions in this spreadsheet. If you have mm -hmm. something that has multiple changes to it or whatever, we'll deal with that later. Let's do this yeah. one first. Yeah, and I will put something in here too to say, you know, please be, you know, careful when you're doing these to make sure that, you know, if you're going to do both, and that's the thing. I don't know, like if you know, like the ITCs, if you guys have situations where you are going to do both, you know, I didn't know if it was going to be, well, we're going to, this one district has, they're just going to be doing the one acquisition, but yeah, they may have a handful of that same district of items that yeah. have multiple acquisitions and they just have to be really careful that those tags don't appear on both. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we've done maybe 10 to 12 brand new ones and now we're getting into districts that have multiples. I mean, the first ones they did not. And I'm like with you, why would you want to put multiple acquisitions in here? If you're, it's a brand new inventory, it's like, this is what it costs. And this is what it is as, to, as of today. So I would say, you know, don't do multiple acquisitions. However, we've got some districts now that have the multiples and they've kept, kept them in their spreadsheets that way. So we need to add them and, and we're running into more and more as we're getting into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, they would have to, yeah. And how would, yeah, it is when it comes to something like this, it's almost like you just have to be careful right. that you don't run into it, but 
it's not a bad idea for us to put those little reminders in here too, so that both the ITC know and that the ITC can, you know, remind the districts of that too. Um, yeah. And, and, the, and the, work, the good but... thing about it and the nice thing about it, and I'm just saying this because we, we are hosted by the MCOECN. Chad's got that creating that instance on there. So nice that when we do a load and we get those duplicate errors, it's like, okay, start it over. Just clean it out and do it over. <laughs> nice. You know? It, it almost like you have to test it, and you know, unfortunately, you know, because it's such a complex thing that you're doing here. It's like you want to make sure that the import runs before you actually do it, you know, and right, um, and, and give it to the district. So it's almost like you, it, it is like a you have to go through like a, you know, a projection of what it's going to be like. Yeah, right. Great tips, though, Sharon. Thank you. I mean, that's helpful for everyone else listening too. And then, you know, this one I struggle with, and just like I kind of struggle with the multiple ac acquisitions, but I understand if they need to have that there and they want to show it. I do struggle with wanting to post um, dispositions. I, it doesn't happen a whole lot, but I, I have come across some tickets. But if it's something, you know, maybe that has been recent and they just want to show that disposition on there, they got sold some, they disposed of some buses, sold some buses or something, and they want those big ticket items to show on their inventory from like the last few years. I get it. Um, so, you know, this step then goes through that. But again, you know, you like, you know, like Sharon said too, we need to be careful if they're going to be doing all of these, you know, for the same district. So this is the easiest one. And then this is when it gets a little hairy is when you get into these. So, but um, I will definitely look these over too and see what we can do just to help things um, a little bit more and provide a little more tips and, and maybe a more thorough explanation on these. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, I believe that is all I had to talk about today. So um, hoping um, you guys have any other questions, please um, ask away. Otherwise, I think we're, we're um, wrapped up our inventory overview. And I think uh, the next thing that's going to happen, I'm going to go over to our training here. Is uh, what do we have next? Um, our next session is at the end of the month, and that's going to be our employee self service. And I'm telling you right now, this is not a training; it's just an overview to just kind of show you guys where we're currently at with ESS because it is ever changing. Is that you know the developers are so focused right now on uh, ESS and getting this done. So we are seeing constant changes in here, and we're basically at the end of the month going to show you where we're currently at, just so you guys get a bit more comfortable. Um, and I'm hoping that some of the um, devs uh, developers will be on uh, that session as well, in case they have some extra information um, that they want to. Um, provide, but um, I don't know how long this session on the 26th is going to go. We had to cancel the 19th, but um, for those of you that did the 19th, you know, you want to uh, sign up for the 26th. Um, so I don't know how long it's going to go, but we're just going to just maneuver through the programs and just show you the different options and stuff like that. We'll have more like training, training per se um, in the future. And also, we're also going to be adding um, a feature article in the April newsletter, which hopefully will come out at the end of next week um, about ESS and also include a recording of a short demo for intended for districts uh, for them to um, just get a better feel for what the application looks like and, and approach it at, as like a standard user. This is what I do to create an, um, a leave request. This is how I view my re leave requests or my calendar. Um, so it's not going to be very long, but just enough so they can get a bit more comfortable with it. 
Um, so that will be included on the next newsletter as well. So, you know, we're kind of gearing up for all of this. Um, and there'll be so much more information to give you guys as this progresses. But we thought April 26 was a good starting point um, for that. So other than that, I think we're good to go. No other questions. You guys have a great rest of your week. And we'll see you soon.